Another picture I want you to look at from your text is on page 778, and that is this figure right here. We have um, a charged conductor in electrostatic equilibrium. So that's what you're looking at here, a charged conductor in electrostatic equilibrium. And what we're going to do is we're going to figure out the electrical potential difference, bless you, from B to A, which is equal to the negative of the integral of E dot dx from A to B. So let's talk about E dot dx. E dot dx is going to be E dx times a cosine of theta. When going from A to B, what do we know about the direction of the electric field relative to the surface, always on a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium? This is one of the four things I asked you to remember. So it's always perpendicular. Notice that the electric field is always perpendicular to the surface. Considering the fact that the electric field is always perpendicular to the surface, what is the angle between the electric field and dS as we go along the surface from A to B? You can answer that one. What is the angle between the electric field and dS as we go from A to B? Miller? 90. 90 degrees. Notice dS is always along the surface, and the electric field is always at a, a normal to that, so it's going to be 90. So we have E dS times the cosine of 90, and we know that's equal to 0. So E dot product with dS is equal to 0. In other words, the electric potential difference between A and B is equal to 0. This means points A and B are both on what is called Jenkins. Equipotential surface. In other words, the surface of a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium is an equipotential surface. The surface of a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium is, we just proved it, an equipotential surface. I should I should get a white marker. <laughs> Two spherical conductors of different radii connected by a wire. We're going to have the radius of the first one, the radius of the second one. The first one is going to have a certain charge Q1, the second one is going to have a certain charge Q2. We know D, the distance between the two of them, is much, much greater than either of the two radii. So they're far enough away where um, the D is much, much greater than either of the radii. We know radius for the first one is larger than the radius of the second one. We just showed, oh, and this is going to be in electrostatic equilibrium. We just showed that the surface of a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium is an equipotential surface. In other words, 
both of these spheres are going to have the same electric potential. So the electric potential for one is equal to the electric potential for two. We just showed that. Considering that is true, we can then say that because these are both spheres, we know that the electric potential for each of these is going to be equal to what? The electric potential difference between a point infinitely far away and a point r distance from either of these spheres is going to be. I'd go with what the fees. Which? K Q of R. So we have then K times Q1 divided by R1 is equal to K times Q2 divided by R2. They are both equal. Everyone brought K to the party, 223. Oh. Q1 over R1 is equal to Q2 over R2. In other words, we get Q1 is equal to R1 over R2 times Q2. We know that R1 over R2 is going to be greater than 1. Agreed? Because we know R1 is greater than R2. Therefore, we know the charge on the larger sphere is going to be greater than the charge on the smaller sphere. The electric field that surrounds, that's caused by charged sphere 1 is going to be equal to doorstep. The electric field that sur surrounds this charged sphere Wants to help her out, we need the electric field that surrounds this charged sphere one. Power up. Can you use the uh, negative QB over the R? Make it too complicated. Rent off. KQ1 over R1 squared. It's just KQ over R squared, right? Going all the way back to chapter two. This is KQ1 over R1 squared. Electric field two then is going to be KQ2 over R2 squared. We can get a relationship between these two. Electric field 1 divided by electric field 2 is going to be equal to K times Q1 divided by R1 squared divided by KQ2 over R2 squared. Which is, if we flip the guy and multiply, K, KQ1 over R1 squared times R2 squared divided by KQ2. Okay, uh, we can cancel out K. We are left with Q1 times R2 squared over Q2 times R1 squared. But we have a relationship between Q1 and Q2. So we can substitute in for Q1. Q1 is equal to R1 over R2 multiplied by Q. This is multiplied by R2 squared divided by Q2 times R1 squared. Right? Q2 cancels out. We lose one of our R1 squareds. We lose one of our R2 squareds. We get that electric field 1 divided by electric field 2 is equal to R2 divided by R1. R2 divided by R1. What do we know about that? It's less than 1. R2 divided by R1 is less than 1. In other words, we can say electric field 1 divided by electric field, or let's do it this way, electric field 1 is equal to R2 divided by R1 
field multiplied by electric field two. In other words, electric field one is going to be less than electric field two. In other words, a smaller radius means a larger electric field. Or if you prefer, the surface charge density is the greatest, is the greatest where radius of curvature is the smallest. Where have we seen that before? Okay, that's just one of that's number four. That was number four of a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium, which I said we cannot prove yet. That would prove it. The smaller the radius means a larger concentration of charge and therefore a larger electric field. 